how this works. So uh, this is our second PDF made easy ITEX 7 talk. The first talk was the day before yesterday and we introduced some simple ITEX examples. Today the talk is PDF is dead, long live PDF. Now the first slide is PDF dead. Why did I have this slide? Well, PDF exists since 93 and it's, for some people it, it's as if PDF has always been around. And people say, what's, what's this with PDF? Shouldn't PDF be dead or, or already? Now this is my version of the PDF specification. It's torn in two, not because I hate PDF, but, but because I, I use it that much. And um, well, in this talk, we are going to look at uh, what is PDF, why is imp PDF important? How does it compare to, for instance, HTML? Because if we look at websites, so uh, we did uh, Duff Johnson, he's, uh, somebody, he's the chairman of the PDF Association. He has done a survey, he has looked with Google on all kinds of websites and he has made an estimate of how many of the pages are HTML. And he says, well, on .com, it's almost 100% of the pages that are HTML. Could be PHP, could be JSP, but the end result is HTML. And could be HTML5, could be HTML4, doesn't matter. But what he noticed is that on .gov sites, on .edu sites, so government and education, the percentage of HTML is lower, much lower. And he sees that governments really love PDF. If he looks at the file formats like .org, PDF, uh, HTML is still king in, in, uh, like in millions of files, but you see that PDF has uh, more significance. On .gov, you see the, the, the red part, that's the part that is actually uh, PDF files, also on .edu. Now, uh, so government, 38% of all the files on government websites are PDF. Now, wh why this difference? Well, we compare publications versus documents. And a publication that could be a book, a journal, a piece of music, an article of a newspaper, and there's no need for such a publication to be self-contained. Um, if you show HTML, you depend on resources on your computer, like a font. Um, it may change over time. So, for instance, if you have a, a, a soccer match, that's Belgium, so if you have a cricket match and you have a, a, a page that has a report about the cricket match, the, the page can be refreshed and can have new, doc, uh, new uh, information. And so, a, a publication, not all the content is produced by the author. You can have, for instance, here we have a, a page on ink and you have the actual article and then you have some advertisement and this advertisement is not made by the author and it can be different in different parts of the world. Like uh, if I look on Twitter over here, I see uh, promoted ads for Kingfisher and in Belgium it's for other uh, types of beer. Now. Um, Publications also are becoming more and more interactive, like on a news site, you can have comments by, the, uh, by other people. A document, on the other hand, it's a piece of written, printed, printed or electronic matter that provides information or evidence or that serves as an official record. It needs to be self-contained. That means that in five years, in 10 years, in 100 years, you still need access to all the resources that were needed. An example is fonts. If you use a font that isn't embedded, how are you going to make sure that in 50 years you still have access to that font? It can't change. It's non-dynamic. -dyna you don't want to make an agreement and then suddenly the agreement changes. So suddenly you, you make an agreement for an, a, a certain salary and suddenly the, the document, the agreement changes and you make less money or more money. Yeah, that may be interesting. You also need to be able to authenticate a document. If someone signs a document, you need to be sure that this person was actually who he claims he is. And you need to be able to secure or protect, protect the document. Like digital signatures uh, can protect the document in the sense that if someone changes the document, the signature gets invalidated. So as a user, you see, hey, this document was tampered with. And you have to be able to secure it. For instance, you may want to encrypt a document. So that, for instance, I wanted to share a document with Stefan there, and he gives me his public key. I use his public key to encrypt a document. Everyone, I can send the document to everyone, 
but only Stefan will be able to read that document because he has the corresponding private key. Now, that's where PDF beats HTML. I know there are, I'm in the ISO committee. There are a lot of companies there who want to do everything with PDF because they are huge PDF lovers. I'm a fan of PDF, but there's a place and time for everything, and there are situations where HTML5 is the better choice, but here, for documents that need to be, uh, have all these qualities, PDF is really the best format. And if you don't count HTML, so if you do the survey, so Dev Johnson did the survey anew in 2015, and if you look at, uh, so year over year, so I think it started in 2011 and 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, you see that PDF uh, had some ups and went, some, went down a little, but still PDF is king. 71.7% in February 2015, that was the amount of uh, the, the, the level of documents on the web uh, compared to uh, document formats such as DOCX, XLSX, PowerPoint, EPUB, and RTF. So uh, PDF is really important in, uh, uh, on the web, and the distinction that we want to make is publications use HTML and HTML depends on the context. Whereas for documents, PDF is forever. PDF, so PDF isn't dead in the sense that there's a lot more to PDF than meets the eye. It was first released as a specification by Adobe in 93, and so Adobe owned the copyright. But Adobe donated the copyright uh, with the purpose to make it a PDF standard. So since 2008, PDF is known as ISO 32000. Uh, it wasn't the first ISO standard for PDF. There were other standards that preceded, like in 2001 PDF X and 2005 PDF A. Like PDF A was based on PDF 1.4, was based on a proprietary specification owned by Adobe. And that's kind of uh, a lot of governments didn't like that. They didn't want to use a specification that dependent on a proprietary standard. So that's one of the reasons why Adobe made the decision to make PDF a uh, NISO standard. And then later on, other standards emerged, and not all of them are made by ISO. You have, for instance, PADES. It's PDF Advanced Electronic Signatures. That's made by an European standards body. Zugfert is a standard based on PDF A3. That is, based, that is a German standard. Now, in this talk, well, we'll talk about uh, iText as a PDF engine. Um, we have a, a, an engine that can produce PDF and uh, that can produce PDF in many different forms. I'm going to give you a first very simple example. So with iText, you don't need to know anything about PDF. You can just create objects like we have an image object of a fox, an image object of a dog. We have a paragraph object that is composed of some text, the quick brown we add an image fox, jumps over the lazy, we add an image doc, and know oh, about this document, just not the stream of text, because a screen reader, without any structural information, will just blather on, will just say all the words one after another, will not make any um, intonation, will not stop for uh, anything else except uh, a full stop, a dot. Um, so it's handy for uh, especially uh, blind people, for example, to know that there is a structure in the PDF. So you want to, if you want to make something accessible, for example, if you're a government, you want everyone to be able to uh, use your documents, uh, including um, disabled people, um, and you want to be uh, as clear as possible as to what is the purpose of this document. For example, this is a list. Um, it's well the. Um, information containing it is not very relevant right now, but this is, it has a title and then it has a number of list items. And um, so the first step is uh, the step one, the, the, the piece that says there. So this is the prefix of the list and it will also be interpreted differently by a decent screen reader. Um, and other steps uh, will be the same thing. So you have the label and the contents. If you have those, that's also uh, a big help to uh, the um, people who need some um, non-visual help in, in interpreting this document. Um, a more uh, pertinent example in general is, can everyone read this? For example, if you're colorblind, um, 
these colors probably look mostly the same to me. I'm not colorblind, so I don't know uh, exactly, but they're fairly similar to people who have um, the uh, Daltonism, is it called, right? Yeah. The, um, so the red, green color blindness. Um, so this is, a, of course, a spider chart with uh, a lot of abbreviations with a uh, number of data. It's about a person who is uh, mildly unqualified for his position and is probably his goals to, that he should achieve um, in order to become the employee that his boss wants him to be. Um, so if you present this as a spider chart, it's impossible for uh, a lot of people to, to read this, especially the blind, of course. Um, we can. Uh, Structure this data differently so you can tag the the the, the image or the uh, the chart in itself and uh, just add all this information, this textual information, so that it can be read out aloud by a screen reader uh, to. Uh, to make sure that everyone can understand what is in there. Um, there's two different ways to do this, so it's two-dimensional, so you can also flip the chart. Uh, this, is the, um, this is one way to present it, uh, so it's just for uh, information you will, uh, for the screen reader, you will, uh, you will uh, write out all the abbreviations, so in the spider chart itself it says MGT, um, and the screen reader will not know that it means management. Of course, the user may, but it's of course a lot easier if for, for them if you just write out management in the um, in the structural representation. There's also uh, well the question what goes into rows and columns. And the, the bigger the biggest thing for the color blind is it has to be color independent. They have to know um, just by by uh, the tabular data that it's it's a lot clearer for them to to understand this. Um, the other way to present this is for this case is a, is a lot better for us because the, the, the person would want to compare their own um, capabilities or their skill level compared to the desired skill level. So a um, uh, screen reader will always read rows, first rows, and then the next row and the next row will not read columns and columns down. So for this um, use case, this, this uh, level, uh, this, this um, way of portraying the data is uh, more, um, more appropriate. Um, um, so if you want to do this with eye text, you want to uh, you have to add a little more, bit more of information. For example, uh, so all the uh, things I said before about uh, giving structural information, that's something that can be achieved by tagged PDF. Um, in iText, this is fairly simple. You just tell the document, the PDF document, this is a lower level um, uh, API. Uh, you just have to say set tagged, and then iText will take care of at least all those things for you. Um, for screening aloud, you want the, the screen reader has to know which language it is, right? For um, the word document, for example, in English it's pronounced document. In French it's written the same, but it's document. So I don't know if you uh, really hear the difference uh, very well, but for li different languages there will be different pronunciations, and the screen reader cannot guess this. So you have to tell it specifically. Um, also, well, the, the more important thing is uh, you have to set a title for the document so that when, the, um, when uh, a blind person, for example, is alt tabbing between different uh, windows in his, uh, in his file system or in his uh, uh, UI, then uh, he wants to know directly which PDF document he is opening. So, for example, then in this case, you said this is a PD iText PDF UI example. Also, you create uh, XMP metadata is something that Bruno will talk about uh, in a minute. Um, some more information: uh, the image, the images in from the earlier example with uh, the um, quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. If you don't add a, an alternate description, the um, uh, PDF reader or uh, Acrobat reader, for example, doesn't know what the image represents, so we'll just skip that part. The, the thing over here is the quick blind jumps over the lazy, and you know, that's not doesn't make sense to a blind person. So if you set an alternate description, this is just uh, also one line of code for every image. You have to set an alternative text, and then it will be read out correctly by. Um, a decent screen reader, it will just say quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, um, something I forgot. Uh, for um, other representations, uh, um, yeah, okay, 
for, for text, uh, you really need to embed the fonts in PDF way because it's also, uh, um, uh, for documents, it's uh, fairly important for uh, the representation to be consistent. Uh, and if you embed the font into the document, then you guarantee that the representation, the, the visual representation will stay the same. So, and the result, um, yeah, it looks the same to you. Uh, it looks the same to everyone uh, who's not blind, but the blind person will be helped a lot more. The tagging, right, the, as I said in the beginning, for tag PDF, um, it says, yeah, this, uh, this structure, this is a paragraph with some information, right? And uh, in, in uh, the screen reader, we know that this figure, if you set the alternate uh, text to Fox, it will know to read out loud Fox. Um, we can't demo that, right? So we had these uh, files on this computer, but unfortunately the computer doesn't uh, pronounce, uh, ha have sound, so uh, unfortunately we can't uh, showcase that. Um, one more thing about embedding the fonts. Embedding the fonts is important because uh, sometimes uh, people who aren't entirely blind, they want to kind of zoom in on the text. And embedding the fonts is important because then you have the complete font description, description as vector data. And then you are 100% sure that uh, the, the zoomed in uh, text will be really well, uh, will be readable. Now, on the importance of making a document archivable. This is not no longer about PDF UA, but about PDF A. And PDF A, also known as ISO 19005, it's for long-term preservation of documents. We all know, well, I'm old. <laughs> I, I, I used to use uh, Office 95, and then I switched to Office 97, and some of my documents in Office 95 rendered completely different than Office 97. PDF A, wants to solve this problem by adding some restrictions to PDF. So you have the complete PDF specification. We are going to restrict that. And we are going to add some obligations. And one of the things that is, about, that is important about ISO 19005 is that approved parts will never become invalid. It will be kind of strange that PDF A1 would become invalid if you have PDF A2, because all the documents that were created with PDF A1 also need to be preserved, preserved for the long term. So individual parts, so if you have PDF A2 after PDF A1, they will define new useful features. They will not kind of duplicate the old versions. Obligations and restrictions, you need to have metadata. Um, Bernard also mentioned XMP, XMP that's the extensible metadata plat platform. ISO 16684. This is metadata in XML format that is added to the PDF in clear text. So if you have a PDF file, that's a binary file, but not all the software can understand PDF. So what XMP means and what is mandatory here is that in this binary file, you have a clear text file, so plain ASCII, that is XML, and software that is not aware about PDF can parse this file and find the XMP and then has metadata that can be read by any uh, software that can read uh, plain ASCII and that can uh, parse XML. The document needs to be self-contained, contained, so all fonts need to be embedded so that in five years, in 10 years, in 100 years, you still have access to the font and you can't have any external uh, binary files like movies or sound. No JavaScript is allowed because JavaScript, for instance, you could say, I have a date here, and after this date, I will change some of the content. That would not make, that, that doesn't match with uh, archiving. And no encryption is allowed. Imagine that you encrypt the document, and then in 100 years, nobody uh, has the, the private key, or nobody remembers the password, so encryption also is not done in PDF A. There are three standards. The one dates from 2005. It's based on PDF 1.4, so that was still owned by iText. By, by, sorry, sorry, by Adobe. <laughs> Sometimes I confuse iText and Adobe, but there's a small difference. Now, uh, it defines uh, two levels. Level B is basic. It ensures that the visual appearance will be correct. So if you look at the document today, and you look at the document in 100 years, it will be exactly the same. Level A is the accessible level. It has the same 
uh, restrictions and obligations as level B, but the structural and semantic properties need to be added. So that was what Benoit was explaining. Uh, the PDF needs to be tagged so that if you have like uh, a paragraph that consists of text and images, you need a P for the paragraph, a span for the text, a figure for the figure, so all the structure needs to be there. PDF A2 dates from 2011. This one is based on ISO 30 2001, so it solves the problem of uh, governments who don't want to depend on a proprietary standard. And it introduces features that were new, so that were introduced in 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, like JPEG 2000 that didn't exist in PDF 1.4, collections, object level XMP optional content that was introduced in 1.5, and it has improved support for transparency, common types and annotations and digital signatures. These were already uh, supported in PDF A1, but there were like some interpretation problems. One company interpreted transparency one way, another company interpreted it another way, and so we didn't have a consistent way to uh, create, to render transparent PDFs. And it introduces a level U for Unicode, where you have the visual appearance and all text is in Unicode, so that uh, if you read the characters, you know exactly what the PDF is about. PDF A3 is an identical copy of PDF A2, with only one difference. In PDF A2, all the attachments to the document need to conform to PDF A2. And with PDF A3, you can add attachments that are not ar archivable. I'm going to give you an example. For instance, you have a Word document, you convert it to PDF, you may want to add the original do Word document as an attachment, as a source file. Now, the PDF A3 will be accessible to PDF, and the document is not archivable, but uh, yeah, it could be handy to, to have the, the, the original source anyway. Now we'll adapt the Quick Brown Fox example. Instead of creating a PDF document in iText, we'll create a PDF A document, and we have to add the conformance level. In this case, PDF A1B. So it doesn't have to be accessible. We don't need to make it tagged. We have to introduce a color uh, an output intent. This is because colors can be interpreted in different ways. So it's not because you have red, green, blue that you're 100% sure what the color will look like. So you have to uh, add uh, a kind of uh, output intent that, uh, that uh, defines what the colors look like. We add the XMP metadata, we embed the fonts, and for the rest, our our code is identical to the ordinary quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog example. And so what we have done, we have the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, and in the standards panel we see, uh, well, here, the blue line, that's important. It says the file claims compliance with the PDF A standard, and this is, it's very easy to have a blue line like this. But this doesn't mean that your PDF is actually a PDF A file. It just means that, means that there's a flag set in the PDF, and the flag says, I think I'm a PDF A file. And it has been opened read only to prevent modification. PDF A doesn't mean that you can't modify the file. Actually, there's a button here, enable editing. And uh, why does Adobe Reader present a PDF A file like this? Well, it's very difficult to uh, manipulate a PDF A file and to keep it compliant with PDF A. So you need to be really aware of what you're doing. So Adobe Reader say, or Adobe Acrobat says, enable editing will only allow this, this if the person who uh, edits the file is aware of what he's doing. And then checking the conform conformance in the standards panel, there's a link to verify conformance. If you click on it and it's actually uh, a, a a well formed PDF A, then we will have the status verification succeeded. Now, uh, the PDF A1A example, here we see that we create a PDF A document once more, just like the PDF AB, uh, A1B uh, example. We change the conformance level, the color profile is the same. We use set tagged, that's an, a requirement for PDF A1A, and we uh, at the ultimate descriptions. And what we see now as a result is somewhat confusing. So we still have the blue bar, 
but in the standards uh, thing, in the standards panel, we don't have a link verify conformance out of time and um, so we have an input CSV file from some kind of database that lists all the states of the United States of America uh, there's uh, of course 50 of them and um, there's uh, you want uh, a very high level of, of um, uh, PDF A compliance so you go for 3A then you have to do some uh, extra configuration or some extra lines of code so you have to set that because of uh, the PDF uh, so the 3A level so the, the uh, accessible level um, and uh, so that's coinc oh, not coincidentally but but uh, it's for uh, it's very fortunate that it also helps for the PDF UA compliance then you have to do some more PDF UA um, uh, settings for the set languages and the viewer preferences, etc. The uh, title and then uh, the XMP metadata for uh, both PDF UA and the PDF le A level A. So this is quite, um, you know, uh, it's, yeah, this is this is border boilerplate, but only still a few lines of code. A lot of things happen in the background. Uh, so then, if you if you want, uh, you can add the attachment because it's PDF uh, A3. So you, it doesn't have to be a PDF A file that is attached. So you embed the CSV file um, as, uh, for example, the data. Um, yeah, it's there, right? Yeah, here the uh, the for the embedded file, the PDF. Um, uh, yeah, you you specify what the relationship is between the uh, the. PDF file and the embedded file. So this is just the source data. For example, if um, you had a document, a Word document that was converted to PDF, you would have uh, the uh, source instead of data. So this is this line. Um, so then at the actual ITEX code, once you're uh, creating the table, so you create uh, the table objects uh, in ITEX 7, then you do some, um, some boilerplate uh, code to read the CSV file. And then the important thing is you, when you process it, it's also fairly simple. You add a header cell uh, to, the, to the tables, and then uh, the other cells are just normal cells. And the font is a bit different because for the header cells, the font will be bold. and um, yeah, but mostly it's it's fairly simple. You can see that the tagging structure is uh, is available in the in the uh, resulting document, and you can see that the tabular data is uh, there represented well, and that the first line is uh, is the header cells. Um, oh yeah, of course, and the uh, attachments it, it was added. You see that it was uh, a simple C CSV file as the input data. If you want to preserve that, that's also possible. I briefly mentioned uh, Zuchwert, which is a German standard, and it's a standard for invoicing. And invoicing, it's important because some laws say that if you receive an invoice, you have to store them for seven years, for 15 years, it depends from country to country. So it's important that we make it a PDF A3. Also important is if you send an invoice to someone, it's important that it's accessible. So it always makes sense to make it PDF UA. PDF UA isn't part of the uh, Zugfert standard, but well, we recommend to use PDF UA anyway because it's so simple to, uh, that it's not much more work, work to make it PDF UA compliant. So this means that uh, we have this, this invoice, and you know, if you receive an invoice uh, on a PDF, it's very hard for machines to extract information. Sometimes you have the uh, something with a percent, for instance, 8% sales tax, and then the software needs to look, yeah, you have somewhere 100 and 108. Okay, 100 it must be the price without the sales tax, 8% is the sales tax, 108 is the final uh, result. But it's very difficult. And even with this tagging, so tagging makes it easier because uh, software can see that we have a table with rows and, and some, some values, so software could interpret this, but the Zugfred standard also uh, demands that you add a Zugfred-invoice.xml. You cannot read this, but uh, sorry that the, the, the resolution is a little bit low, but this XML also complies to a standard, the CII standard, the cross-industry invoice standard. And so with this uh, document, you have all the information that is needed to interpret the document. For instance, a human receives 
a PDF invoice in his mailbox. He can send it to his bank, and the bank has all the wiring information that is necessary to process uh, the invoice. For instance, you also have all the invoice lines with uh, maybe one item has a different sales tax than an other item. So um, this is also available in iText. So iText, you have the core engine, and PDF invoice is a value add-on. Uh, actually, how PDF invoice works is we have created an interface with a lot of getters, like get invoice lines. If you implement all these getters, because we don't know how your database is uh, created, so if you implement all these getters, then, and then iText will create this uh, CRI XML out of the box. Also, for instance, suppose that you would uh, forget, so suppose that you would have get VAT number, and you return no, iText will throw an exception because an invoice without a VAT number is not a valid uh, invoice. Now, this is one plugin, and Benoit is now going to highlight uh, another plugin, the PDF Calligraph plugin. So that's the new improved typography. Yeah, so um, uh, I don't know how many of you have used iText 5, but um, uh, there was uh, a number of missing links in uh, the, the original in iText 5, so it's been around for a number of years. And uh, so one of the reasons we uh, decided to go forward with iText 7, so the, the newest version, is because of those missing links, because it was impossible to include them into the, uh, the source code because of, you know, uh, um, constraints that were put on ITEX 5 a long time ago and that we couldn't work around. So one of the big, biggest things we uh, really decided to go forward with is uh, index scripts. This is in iText. It was the only unsupported major script family. So um, this is, of course, um, maybe quite relevant to you. It was feature request number one. We got a lot of customer questions, uh, especially, of course, from uh, Asian companies for the uh, index script families that's also used in uh, uh, the whole of Southeast Asia, for example, in Thai and Malayalam, etc. Um, so we thought this is a huge opportunity uh, for us and for our customers, and uh, especially because it's uh, very limited, the support rate is very limited in other PDF libraries. There were some other features uh, for the PDF Calligraph that we decided to include. Um, so the optional ligatures, which I'll show an example of in a minute, and uh, viral diacritics in Arabic. Arabic was supported, was always supported, uh, but uh, it was not very intuitive. And uh, once the viral diacritics had to come in, for example, for Quran texts, um, that was uh, very problematic. And uh, you know, it's uh, it was a big problem that needed to be solved. Um, one of the basic problems we had with a Belgian company is the lack of expertise. I couldn't read. Uh, Devin Agari a year ago. I still can't read it very well, but I can read some of it. Um, and uh, the biggest thing about this is that there's a lot of different index scripts you are probably well aware of. This. Um, Unicode, the Unicode standard, Unicode 8.0, encodes 49 index scripts. There's more, more than 49, but those are the ones that are uh, officially supported right now in Unicode. Once the Unicode uh, standard expands again, uh, there will probably be more. Um, so the index scripts, uh, as you are also well aware, is, uh, uh, can be very complex. So I decided to um, add three examples of different features that are, uh, well, not, not unique to index scripts, but very prominent in index scripts, and that we had some problems with. So one of them is glyph repositioning. Um, so this is the ha. Um, the, the, so the first example is the ha. So, uh, um, sign and uh, it's modified to an e, so he, and um, so the the vowel which comes which you type after the uh, the um, uh, the consonant needs to be shown uh, to the left of it. So this was a big problem for us. It was something that we couldn't really solve in ITEX 5 and we decided to tackle. Uh, so glyph substitution, another one, is that uh, um, a di it looks like a diacritic, but it modifies the entire shape of the glyph, so it's uh, a different glyph. And uh, the half characters in Devanagari are a very prominent feature. If there's no uh, vowel sounds after a consonant, then only uh, about half of the character will be shown. Um, this is uh, why is this all unsolvable for the ITX5 uh, font engine? Is because there's no dedicated 
uh, Unicode points for all these, uh, for example, for the half characters, uh, for the glyph sub substituted glyphs, there are also similar in spare ranges of the Unicode, um, uh, of the, of the, the Unicode uh, point space. So, um, yeah, this is, this is always font dependent, so a font can choose wherever they want to put it there as long as it's not another valid Unicode point. So, uh, we didn't know how to read this one, this, this kind of thing. And most of the spare Unicode ranges are located above, uh, so the, the two byte range, so you have to get uh, three or four bytes uh, of content. So, and we couldn't read about, uh, past this because ITEX5 had a uh, long time ago made a decision to um, encode the, the uh, Unicode glyph position as a character, so a car, so two, uh, only two bytes, so it was impossible to, to uh, expand on this. And of course, um, we could support Arabic because um, uh, ligaturization is mandatory in, um, uh, in Arabic and also the, these, uh, the alternate glyphs, they have uh, their own uh, fixed Unicode positions. So um, this is a big difference compared to, to uh, the context dependent ligaturization in the index scripts. So a big solution is to just rewrite the font engine. We didn't throw away our previous font implementation because it was very valuable for most uh, things, but you had to, we really had to revamp it to, to overhaul it. And because it's so central to the PDF format, we, you know, this is one of the reasons that to, to go with a new major version is that it was impossible to keep uh, compatibility, backwards compatibility. And um, so, the uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, so the new font engine really was uh, one of the big features of uh, of ITEX seven. So um, when once we were at it, we decided to do some uh, you know some extra things. Being, for example, if you wanted to write Arabic in uh, ITEX five, you needed to specify spe um, that it was right to left text. ITEX didn't know that beforehand, so you had to specify directly, say, uh, an extra line of code saying this is right to left text, whereas it's fairly easy to see it's in the Unicode ranges. You can see directly if it's in Arabic Unicode ranges, it sh has to be right to left. Same thing with Hebrew. Um, then uh, we decided for the index scripts to create a separate module. Um, because it's only called, we need it to be it to be only called when necessary. If you always execute a lot of the logic in the um, in this module, then we would lose performance for a lot of other use cases. So we really needed to separate this. And then, um, well, of course, this is something quite uh, specific about it. So the glyph uh, replacement rules they are different per writing system, and also uh, they can be font dependent. So the, as I said already, the position of the alternate glyphs, the um, position dependent glyphs, are, can be uh, dependent on wherever the font decides to place them. So we did some examples. The code is uh, fairly trivial. It's just a string. Uh, text with the Unicode points that you want to use, and then uh, you add them to the documents. So as you can see, the, so there's always an incorrect and a correct way to do it. If you can read, I, I assume most of you can uh, read uh, Devan Agar, it's Hindi, it's uh, Sahityakar, um, means writer, apparently. Uh, yeah. So um, if you don't use the PDF Calligraph uh, module, then it will come out wrong, it will be somewhat readable, I guess. You will at least understand it, but it's, of course, not correct. So it's uh, very important, of course, for our documents to, to uh, look correct. Uh, so then, the, um, as I said before, the glyph, uh, glyph repositioning of the I, the E, probably more, um, is, uh, you know, if it's not executed if you don't use the PDF Calligraph module, but it is if you do the, um, if you do use it. Same thing for the, uh, the vial, the, the, uh, GIF with the with the uh, Holland below it, it uh, will be shown incorrectly unless you use PDF Calligraph. So this is Devanagari. Another script we support is uh, Tamil, very fairly recently. So the word Elitalar um, is uh, so it has a different glyph, but a similar glyph to the one I showed before. So um, as you can see on the incorrect way, the second glyph is uh, represented incorrectly and then with the big swirl underneath it, uh, that is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, the same thing happens for Arabic, so you need to use the PDF Calligraph to do this, otherwise this is just uh, like spelling for in Arabic. I don't know how many of you uh, can read Arabic, but this 
with, is wildly wrong in Arabic. If, if you show this to someone who knows Arabic, they will say this is just gibberish. So they need to, write, to read it like the, the, uh, the uh, second line, El Katibu. Um, needs to be uh, written like that, or it's unreadable to them. And then, as I said before, you need a low-level API, low-level API to do this for uh, the Latin fonts because it's a fairly specific uh, use case. And um, so the difference is, is, first of all, it's not ungrammatical, it's not unreadable. It's something that you can do optionally. It's uh, you know something for very fancy fonts. For if you want to do something with uh, very um, uh, advanced visual design, you need to have a font that supports these, and then the I, the T, and the E can be combined into one big glyph that looks like a big, you know, handwriting style. So this is uh, the status of uh, advanced typography now in ITEC 7. So ITEC 7 will be released uh, next week. We uh, already support, as I could show Devanagari and Tamil. Uh, we are working on Telugu, and others are based on customer demands because there's so many that it's hard for us to, to guess how many will be used. So of course, we want our customers to tell us, please develop this for us, and then we will do that. Uh, normally, if it's, um, you know, if it's something that we can see that's uh, uh, that will be used quite a lot. Um, so if you have any requests, you can come by to the booth later and say, hey, I want this for Canada or for um, Gurmukhi or you know any other script. That is, of course, it has to be supported by the Unicode standard. That is a basic requirement. Um, for Arabic, um, so it's still under development to vocalize Arabic to something that we only started recently. It shouldn't be too much work, so it should be available in the next few weeks as well. Um, but uh, it's also a big difference. So we have re um, received some requests from customers, for example, for Arabic reading courses. Right? Arabic is normally written without the vowels. If you don't know Arabic, then it's impossible to know what the vowels will be. So we need them if you want to do an introductory course for uh, Arabic. And as I could show earlier, the optional ligatures in Latin uh, text are fully supported. So that was uh, basically all. If there are any questions, we'd be happy to uh, to answer or try to answer them. Go ahead. I have a question with respect to uh, international variation. How we can support multiple languages? Say, for example, I have one invoice, and then I want to send it in a two different uh, languages, one for English and another one for Arabic. So how do you? Um, well, you need some custom logic for both of them. You could, you could probably reuse most of the code, but you would have to feed the data, the, the textual data differently. But that could be done fairly easy. You just need some programming logic that says, well, this is the Arabic invoice or this is the Latin invoice. Yeah. So in the old I text, suppose that you had Arabic and Latin text, you would have to write different code because the Arabic, you would have to set right to left. Now you can just use the same code. The only thing that is different is the data that you feed. And so ITEX will now detect, hey, I'm Arabic. It will go from right to left. Or if you feed Latin text, then it will go from left to right. So that's uh, now much more intuitive. And uh, even if you have some mixed text, like uh, you have an Arabic text with internationalization, and internationalization is written I, eight, and so on, then the Arabic text will go from right to left, and then the I, eight, N will not be reversed, but will be uh, written in the correct uh, direction. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the question is uh, locale. So you have uh, in your uh, uh, program you, you use a, a specific locale. Now in PDF, PDF just uses fonts. So PDF doesn't really care for a locale. The only the only time that PDF cares for a locale is for uh, accessibility. Where, like uh, Benoit said, the locale is important to know the pronunciation. But as for fonts, you have a, a character code that maps to a glyph. So that, that that problem doesn't really exist in PDF. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Can, can I the fonts the image file? For example, like image. 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 Oh, image files. Image files. Mm -hmm. So, image files. So, um, 
I, I'm going to give you different answers because I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So if you have an image, like a scanned image of text, we don't do OCR. So we will not take an image and say, well, uh, we have pixels here that look like an E. We don't do that. That's, there's other software to do that. So, uh, and what we also don't do is to create uh, images from PDF. So uh, we just create PDFs from data, from vector data. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah. HTML. Okay. Um, so the question is, does, does iText support HTML to PDF? Uh, the, the answer is, it depends. So iText is not an URL to PDF converter because uh, a URL you have, you have, if you look at the HTML file, and you start reading the HTML file from the, from the top. In the website, you can be at the end of the HTML file and have something that says, I go on top of the page with CSS. Now, with iText, that doesn't work because iText is, was built for speed and, and low memory use. So what we do is we read, H, we read HTML, we render it to a page, and as soon as the page is full, we send it to the output stream and we clear the memory. So when we have pages that are sent to the output stream, and suddenly we see something that says, I go on top. Yeah, we can't go back to the first page. So this being said, iText does support HTML to PDF. And we use HTMS, HTML as a template format. I'm going to give you an example of a, a Belgian company. Uh, it's a printing office. And they print quotes and invoices for different customers. And they have created an application. They created the application only once that says, well, we'll take very simple HTML, just tables, just black and white. And we'll ask our customers to give their data in this format. Well, actually, they get it in XML, and then they use XSLT to create that simple HTML. That's on a, a detail. Then for every customer, they ask for a CSS, and they ask for a letterhead, like a one-page uh, PDF, company stationary. And so what they do is they merge the HTML with the CSS uh, for one company, you have like a, a blue table headers for the other company, you have green table headers. So they merge the HTML with the CSS. They render it to PDF with that company stationary as background. So that, that's, that's a typical use case. And we're uh, expanding on this. We uh, have now a merge, we have had a merger with Hancom, uh, a South Korean company last year. And they are uh, specialists in uh, Word, Excel, uh, PowerPoint, they have a web office, and we are going to use their code for um, Excel so that we can use that code to create a template designer in a browser. And so on the back end, you will have uh, XML, and because it's based on their Excel product, we could also have formulas, like saying this cell is the sum of all these cells. and what is the difference with Excel? We will have like the opportunity to, to define these rows. These are headers. If there are multiple pages, these need to be repeated. Or this row, this is part of a table, and this row can be repeated, for instance, as many times as there are invoice lines in an invoice. And so there, uh, th this will be HTML5 based, where we will be able to create a, temp create a template. Oh, sorry. My, I'll continue. Create a template fill it with data, and then render this data to PDF. But that's, that's for the future. That's not ready yet. Uh, 